Twenty-three. Dunkeld, Glengarry, Sky March, Federated Commonwealth, Fourth of April, thirty fifty-six. Ghost two. This is Ghost Leader. Report your status. Hearing Alex Carlyle's voice over the comm channel made Davis Clay smile with relief under the faceplate of his neuro helmet. Thank God, Alex was all right. Ghost Leader. Ghost two. He replied, "Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your vacation." His fingers were punching up a full sit rep from the Griffin's computer as he spoke. All systems nominal. Haven't had to use any ammo yet. That means I can cover the withdrawal if Galeno's running low. Ah, he's posted three kilometers south. Alex's voice cut him off. As usual, he seemed to have the whole tactical situation right at his fingertips. Even though he couldn't have been out of his cell for more than a few minutes, using the dervish to stir up a ruckus, I'm helping Major King coordinate now, and I've got the tactical computer right here. Great, Skipper," Clay replied. "We'll start phase four right away. Negative on that. Negative. We've got a change of plans too. All units to converge on the residence immediately. Repeat, converge on the residence. Some of our people were moved there." Christ on a crutch," Clay muttered. "Ah,、uh, Roger that, Ghost Leader. May I suggest you let Headshot hold his current? We need him to keep off those damned jets. They're coming around for another strike." "Yeah, I see 'em," Alex said. "Right, but you get it in gear. We've got to get to the residence while we still have some momentum." Unspoken was the thought that had plagued King and the whole strike force from the very beginning. The possibility that the Vries might decide to use the hostages as bargaining chips, judging from Caitlin's second-hand warning, the governor had already threatened some of them to get Major De Villars' cooperation. If the Vries thought he had nothing left to lose, understood, leader, Clay said, his pleasure gone in an instant. We're on it, strikers, strikers. This is Ghost Two. New orders. Repeat. New orders. Inside the residence, Corporal O'Leary faced the Governor General. We have to go now, Governor. We don't have much time left. Damn it! The Vries studied the grizzled mercenary with a sinking feeling deep in his gut. Corporal O'Leary had been with Walters for years, and it was never any secret that his first loyalty lay with the Colonel rather than his adopted world. Now the man's tone, abrupt, almost menacing, made it clear that the mercenaries weren't planning to let their employer interfere with Walters's evacuation plan. What the Legion had done was incredible. The Vries had thought all their units were accounted for, but they'd somehow scraped an operation together anyway, and without the benefit of any of their senior leadership. The only officer above the rank of lieutenant who hadn't been rounded up in the first hours of the coup was King. Their technician, and he shouldn't have been able to mount an attack. But the attack was going on anyway, and the whole world was crumbling around Roger de Vries. The Legion was going to fight no matter what he did, and that meant the Free Sky Armada would launch its attack after all. War would come to Glengarry, and whoever won, the Governor General whose plan to keep peace had failed, would be persona non grata with the victors. The Great Death would never trust him again, and General von Bülow wouldn't be likely to renew negotiations once the Legion started fighting back. Governor, O'Leary repeated, making the word sound more like an epithet. All right, all right, I'll give the orders, the Vries said. Maybe the plan Walters was hatching, as relayed by O'Leary, would work after all. If they could escape and link up with von Bülow's landing troops, they might salvage something yet. I'll have the VTOL ready to lift in say fifteen minutes. Make it ten. We don't have much time before the bastards are knocking at our gates. But the Vries saw O'Leary's expression and bit off the protest. Ten minutes, then. I'll pass the word back to the colonel. But I need you to do something for me while I'm getting things together here. The corporal looked suspicious. What? There wasn't even the pretended courtesy of the title anymore. 
my daughter. She has been confined to her rooms in the south wing until she decides to accept the inevitable. If we're pulling out, she goes with us. I want you to get her and bring her to the helipad to meet us. O'Leary started to open his mouth in reply. Then his face took on an expression of thoughtfulness. Your daughter, huh? All right, Your Excellency, I'll bring her. Just make damn sure you have the veto ready to go. The look in the man's eyes made it clear that Caitlin would pay a heavy price if anything went wrong. The Vries swallowed and nodded. Walters and his mercs had already demonstrated the power of hostages in their handling of Major de Villar. He knew they wouldn't hesitate for an instant to use Caitlin if it would get them what they wanted. As O'Leary hurried out of the office, he was already punching in the call code to alert his pilot and the VTOL ground crew. Roger de Vries couldn't afford any more mistakes. Not with Caitlin's life, and probably his own come to that at stake. The door slid open suddenly, and Caitlin de Vries whirled where she stood. From her rooms overlooking the south side of Castle Hill, all she'd been able to see was the disturbance that had put the whole residence on alert was a light show down near the base of the hill. She vaguely recognized the short, stocky NCO framed in the open door as one of her father's bodyguards. Visible beyond him were two more planetary guards, part of the detail that had been watching her quarters since the first day of the coup. Both were obviously edgy at the approaching sound of battle. Caitlin drew her robe shut over her pajamas, conscious of the way the man was studying the curves revealed by the gauzy New Kyoto silk. She wasn't particularly shy about her body. Nobody who had to work day and night wearing the skimpy shorts and cooling vest that were the usual in an overheated max cockpit was likely to retain any shyness about showing a little skin. But she didn't like the look in the man's eyes. Just what in Blake's name do you think you're doing, Corporal? She demanded, using her best governor's daughter voice, as she drew herself up to her full height and fixed him with an icy stare. Haven't you ever heard of buzzing before you barge in? The NCO's expression didn't change. Never mind that now, he snapped. You're coming with us. She backed away as he advanced. Where? What's going on? Your father wants you. Now move. Caitlin took another step away from him. At least let me get dressed. Now, I said. The corporal's sidearm, a deadly-looking vibroblade, was in his hand. I said I'd fetch you, but I didn't promise you'd still be in one piece. Get moving. Caitlin didn't hesitate any longer. The look in the man's eyes told her he meant business with the vibroblade, and she wasn't about to give him a reason to prove it. Not until a moment of her choosing, anyway. Out in the corridor, the non-com gave a curt order to the two soldiers. Helipad, he snapped. Move it. They took the lead, while the corporal trailed Caitlin, his blade at the ready. The stamp of their booted feet contrasted sharply with the slap, slap, slap of her slippers on the fake stonework of the corridor floor. The two guards took the turn that led to one of the lifts, and Caitlin allowed herself a smile. The stairs wouldn't have been suitable for what she had in mind. The lift doors slid open promptly, and the first guard stepped quietly inside. The second was moving aside to let Caitlin and the corporal pass, when she stumbled and lurched into him. Ow! she complained. Damn floppy slippers! The trooper reached out to help her, and in that instant she used her momentum to carry her past him. Her mech-trained reflexes took over, and with a swift motion she grabbed the man's arm and pulled him around so that he was between her and the corporal's vibroblade. He started to shout something and jerked back. Her left hand speared straight into his stomach, and before he could even double over from the force of the blow, she caught him with an open-palmed chop to the bridge of the nose. His mouth worked, but no sounds came out as he staggered back and straight into the vibroblade. It whined as it sank into his back, and Caitlin leapt forward. The corporal tried to yank the blade free, but she was on top of him first. A chop to the wrist made him release the blade 
and the soldier and vibroblade together fell to the floor. Then she brought her knee up into the noncom's groin. He doubled over, out of the fight for the moment at least. Caitlin spun again as the guard in the elevator launched through the doors, his rifle at the ready. In that split second she flashed on the face of Lieutenant Bergstrom, who periodically instructed the cadets in quick kill and other martial arts disciplines. Standing sternly before the cadets, he was saying, The first rule when facing an opponent with better weaponry is to even the odds. Get inside his weapon range, and you're back on level ground. She acted on the thought before the soldier could swing the rifle around to cover her, leaping at him with a loud yell. The man flinched as Caitlin gave him a chop across the throat. Then he was down. She jerked the vibroblade out of his comrade's back, then turned on the downed soldier, who was slowly, painfully trying to straighten up. Now, corporal, she said in a low, dangerous tone, while prodding him in the stomach with the tip of the knife. Suppose you just tell me what's been going on. This is it! This is it! shouted the driver of the Legion's hover carrier. Hold on back there! In reaction to his warning, Alex Carlyle gripped a strap mounted on the hover carrier's front partition, hastily double-checking the restraints that held the portable computer terminal in place. The carrier skewed sideways as it came to a stop, and a motley group of technician soldiers and armed ex-prisoners at the rear of the passenger compartment were piling out before the turbofans had shut off completely. Julio Vargas, the aerospace pilot, brandished a stern shaft pistol as he barked orders. Move, 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 he urged, waving the pistol with one hand and using the other to shove men towards the rear door. With his bristling black mustache and the ammo belts for the team's machine gun draped across his chest, Vargas looked like a stock bandito character from some Tri-D costume drama. Aircraft! Aircraft incoming! Someone shouted. On Alex's monitor, the three blips that represented the surviving planetary guard aircraft were swooping low in another attack run. He could hear the rattle of machine gun fire outside as the lead jet started strafing the legionaries on the ground. Strike one! Strike one! He called as his hands stabbed the comlink button. Headshot! Get those bastards off us! Roger that, ghost leader! The cadet mech warrior replied, imperturbable. Unlike his father, Cristiano de Villar rarely ever betrayed his emotions. I've got them! Legion strike force! Legion strike force! A familiar voice crackled over the comlink. Legion strike force! This is cadet de Vries! Please respond! It was Caitlin. Alex checked his automatic impulse to respond to the call. He hadn't seen or heard anything about her since the coup, but the fact that she'd been assigned to the governor's staff just before the whole crisis had erupted didn't look good. And the governor was, after all, her father. Alex couldn't imagine going against his own parent. But how could they trust her now? This had to be some kind of trick. Beside him, Major King turned quickly and keyed the comlink. This is King, he said, raising his hand to cut off Alex's protest. Go ahead, cadet. I've got important information, Major, she said, sounding breathless. They're getting ready to evacuate, my father and Colonel Walters, by veto from the helipad. I think Walters intends to take some of the Legion officers as hostages. Where are the hostages now? King demanded. Third, third floor, she replied. South wing, I think. I'm heading that way now, but if you can get anyone else up here... Understood, King said. Good work, De Vries. As King cut the comlink, Alex finally gave voice to an angry protest. It's a trap, Major. Has to be. King shook his head. It was Cadet de Vries who tipped us off to this mess in the first place. Got a message out for one of the resident's service people. Her father probably didn't want to lock her up with the rest of you, but he had her under house arrest just the same. We're damned lucky she got loose when she did. 
The tech major paused, tapping the computer console restlessly. All right, cadet. You take half the troops and try to find the hostages on the third floor before they move them again. Captain Vargas and the rest will start a regular sweep of the building. I'll get the other carrier up to support us. Got it? Yes, sir, Alex said. He drew the laser pistol he'd been given during the short trip to the residence and checked its charge reading. Then he hurried to the rear door, shouting orders to the Aztec in command of one of the original assault squads. One of the jets stooped low overhead, twin machine guns chattering. Across the wide circle drive in front of the residence building, a running figure in Legion battle dress went down, flinging his battle rifle away as he fell. With a shock, Alex realized it was Cadet Wemis, who commanded the Cadet Company's reconnaissance lance. From the far side of the military compound, an autocannon blazed away at the aircraft. Cadet de Villar's rifleman kept up the steady AAA fire until the jet was out of sight, then switched to target the next aircraft as it started a fresh strafing run. Now a laser flashed, and Alex's eyes followed the path of the light pulse to the target overhead. In the half-light of the rising sun over the firth of Dunkeld, he saw the jet's left wing leaking smoke from a damaged engine. The aircraft seemed to stagger in mid-air before it started an almost graceful arc toward the ground, heading straight for the rifleman. Autocannon rounds slammed into the crippled aircraft, shredding away shards of metal and debris, but the shattered hulk continued its plunge, burning now. It struck the battle mech like an outsized missile, and in a rear of fire and thunder, the mech came apart. Secondary explosions ripped through the ruin from detonating autocannon ammo, spreading burning wreckage over hundreds of meters and setting a nearby building aflame. Alex stared in sick horror and revulsion at the sight. It had happened so fast. And Cristiano de Villar was gone, just like that. He hadn't even had time to punch out. Vargas shook Alex, hard, with a tight grip on his shoulder. Snap out of it, kid, he shouted. You've got a job to do. Move. Alex tore his gaze away from the smoldering hulk that had been de Villar's rifleman and forced himself to act. But as he led his squad up the steps to the residence doors, he felt like a robot, detached from the action, going through the motions. No simulation had ever prepared him for the reality of battle.